Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fruitful Trees. I have made so many videos on so many different topics, and I love it. I love it, and I keep learning, and I hope you're learning as well. Today's video is going to be at the top of the list, one of the best ones I've ever made that I've learned so much from. And we're back at Tropical Acres Farms talking about mangoes. But this time, we're talking about Indian variety mangoes that are growing here in South Florida. I believe Alex at Tropical Acres Farms has the biggest selection of Indian mangoes here outside of India, here in the United States. And he has dozens and dozens of varieties of Indian mangoes. And we didn't have a chance to cover all of them. We covered 11 varieties, I believe, today. And I'm going to list them in the description below. And this is part one. We will go back to his farm and do part two, maybe even a part three, maybe even a part four, to get all the Indian varieties of mangoes. I learned so much from this video, and you will as well. I ended up buying uh, one or two of the varieties after making this video because it was just amazing. So this is Alex at Tropical Acres Farms. I'm putting his link below the video with the name of all these descriptions. Remember, if you want to get one of these trees, uh, budwood, the tree, or even taste the fruit, the link's below. Get out to Tropical Acres Farms and order a tree and try the fruit. Here it goes. All right, everybody, here we are at Tropical Acres Farms, and uh, there's uh, the shirt, Tropical <laughs> Acres Farms, and that's Alex. How are you doing today? Doing good today. Um, we uh, had a pretty productive day, so. Great, happy. great. So we're going to be talking today about different types of mangoes, and we're going to be talking about mangoes from India. Specifically mangoes from India that we're growing here in Florida. So obviously we grow lots of Indian flavored mangoes, but the number it is actually from India directly is pretty substantial and uh, it's in the dozens and we'll go over a number of them. We can't go over all of them obviously but we'll go over quite a few and talk about how they behave here in Florida's climate um, you know relatively speaking because uh, there's some pretty huge differences in how they perform and of course we have lots of people here that are originally from India or people that are from here that are interested in mangoes from over there that they're not used to seeing here in Florida. Okay, so when you grew up, when you grew these mangoes, put these in, did you specifically do them because you had a farm and you wanted to cater to different people or do you personally prefer these? Like some people like these better. A lot of these I had never even had before. I mean, a few of them we had, had tried before, but a lot of them we had never had because they were uncommon here in Florida. But we knew that before we ever started planting the trees here, you know, Jack and I knew that there was a lot of people from India that uh, have moved to the United States that had a nostalgic attachment perhaps to certain types of mangoes, just as like a native Floridian who grew up in South Florida might be attached to Hayden and Kent and so forth. Uh, it's like that throughout the world, but India is kind of the birthplace of the mango. Um, and it has the largest, probably largest variety of mangoes in the world uh, in, within that country. So we knew that some of them could do okay here and some of them wouldn't. And this being kind of an experimental project of sorts, we were willing to try out all these different kinds of Indian mangoes to see how they did. Okay, so the first one we'll go and we'll take a look at is the Alfonso mango because it's probably the most famous mango associated with the country of India and uh, one of the most requested Indian mangoes. Now typically, is it known not to grow that great here is what yeah, I Yeah, Alfonso has a poor reputation in Florida, unfortunately. It was introduced a very long time ago. In fact, Alfonso was one of the first varieties that was sent from India in the late 1800s. It was uh, with a group of other mangoes that were sent from the Pune area of India. Um, and uh, that was part of a, a project by the USDA to introduce um, varieties of mangoes that weren't present here from different parts of the world. But the first attempt involved Alfonso, uh, Malgoba, and a number of other varieties, uh, some of which are names that aren't recognizable anymore because these were names that were around in the 19th century. But Alfonso was already well known by that point in time. Um, Alfonso, the name comes actually from, uh, I believe, a part of India that was colonized by the Portuguese. 
hence that, that name, which uh, is not like a native uh, Indian name. So, uh, but it was recognized several centuries ago, so it's one of the oldest cultivated varieties of Indian mangoes. And of course the Portuguese arrived in India like probably in like the 16th century or something. Somebody could correct me on that, but um, that's the connection there with that name. So here we are, we're standing in front of our only Alfonso tree in the ground. Our only regular Alfonso, because actually we have a couple Alfonso derivatives here as well that we're going to talk about. But um, Alfonso was introduced in the late 1800s to Florida unsuccessfully the first time. After several other attempts, they were able to get it established here. But it never did well. It didn't like our climate, didn't like our soil very much. And so consequently, Alfonso trees will grow here. So don't get the impression that they can't grow. Absolutely, they can be grown and they're found within the Florida nursery trade because there are people who want to try to grow them. Um, the issue with Alfonso here is getting it to produce mature fruit. So a couple obstacles for the Alfonso mango in Florida. Number one, it doesn't flower very well here. Um, so uh, over in India, um, the areas it grow, it's grown kind of vary in terms of what kind of temperatures they receive, but with our warmer winters that we've been receiving here for the last well, actually, even before the, the winters ever got warm, Alfonso had some issues flowering here with regularity. But it's a very vigorous tree. It often flushes growth a little too late in the year, and then, um, you know, its stems aren't as mature, possibly, as some other mangoes that have gone dormant uh, by fall. And uh, it's... Uh, when it does flower, it's very prone to disease, especially powdery mildew and anthracnose. So if you don't control powdery mildew on Alfonso, and this happens in California too, actually, when they try to grow Alfonso, um, it can get very decimated by powdery mildew fungus on the flowers, and then you end up with not a lot of fruit. But it can also, at the same time, get anthracnose, which can decimate not just the flowers, but the small fruits that powdery mildew doesn't impact. So a lot of times when people try to go, grow Alfonso in Florida, they're in an area that's too humid for it. If you're going to try to grow Alfonso, you really want to be in a drier part, like the coastal zone that we occupy here. Alfonso has a better chance of fruiting here. Um, and you probably should have a disease control program as well. So uh, this Alfonso, you can see, has very thick, dense foliage. Uh, the trees need to be pruned well to open up some airflow uh, and sunlight to give them a, a, an assist knowing that they're kind of disease pro, uh, prone. Now another issue Alfonso has here is that a lot of times the fruit does not taste the way it does in India and that's just a consequence again of the soil that it's being grown in compared to the soil that it's being grown over in um, uh, the part of India uh, that they grow it commonly. And so, uh, but what we found was when we planted our Alfonso tree the first few years that it fruited, I believe it fruited like three years after we planted it. So not did not take very long, but the first few years that we got fruit off the tree, the fruit had a very odd taste and not a pleasant taste, like almost rancid in some respects, um, or fetid, you know, like uh, like it's it was not good. And we were so embarrassed by it that we actually didn't sell it to customers the first couple of years. And then um, about the third crop it made, I believe it was, it started tasting nasty for the first couple of weeks and we thought we were gonna have to top work the tree. And then something changed and the fruit started tasting actually pretty good. Um, and to the point where we started giving it to customers and they actually requested it. Uh, so it got better and it's been better ever since. So, but that can be an issue with Alfonso in Florida. People that are expecting it to taste like it does you know, like the Ratnagiri Alfonso does, um, will oftentimes be disappointed. But that isn't always the case. So we'll look at some of the fruit that's on this tree right now that's developing. <clears throat> and this is kind of typical size for Alfonso here. Um, they can get a little bigger than this. These fruit actually are not that close to maturity yet. Uh, for whatever reason, this side of the tree made the majority of the fruit this year. And uh, it does kind of bear in clusters, actually. But you can see what the issue was, that a lot of the tree just didn't flower. 
And that's the case with this tree most years. We've had one year in particular where it really made a lot of fruit um, because it had like, I would say the majority of the canopy bloomed that year. That was uh, not last year, I think the year before. Um, but otherwise it's usually like kind of sparse bloom, um, you know, throughout the canopy. It's not very solid. It's not like half the tree flowers and half doesn't. It's just interspersed throughout the canopy where we'll get panicles coming out of it. But um, so a difficult tree to control and a tree that absolutely you cannot uh, feed a lot of nitrogen to in Florida because it will grow very rapidly at the expense of its fruiting. So um, anyway, so we on, because we only have the one, we never have a lot, so we don't like sell boxes of Alfonso. It will sometimes make it into our Indian flavor boxes, um, but it's a mango that we have to quality control check a lot because of that previous flavor issue that it had um, and uh, because they can sometimes get what's called spongy tissue where the flesh breaks down internally. Now that's a problem that it has in India too. So even though it can get it in Florida, it's not something that's unique to Alfonso being grown in Florida. Um, and that's typically due to a calcium deficiency when that happens. Um, but anyway, um, we do sell some small number of them, okay? Um, but it's not a mango that you can expect to get from us um, if you just request it. Uh, so we'll see how it goes this year and how the quality comes out. Hopefully it's pretty good and comparable to the way it's been in previous years. It doesn't tree ripen very well, so um, it really uh, is a mango that should probably be picked mature green when the top starts to turn yellow or orange or a little red. So would you say that Alfonso is the most around the world the most commercialized Indian mango of all of them? Well, it's the most well-known. Um, it's not been successfully introduced to most other countries. In fact, really, um, you know, central southern India is kind of the only place that they grow this mango on a very large commercial scale. Most attempts to introduce it to other parts of the world have failed pretty badly. So Florida is not unique in that regard either. If they take Alfonso to most other places, they're usually disappointed by the performance. So, um, okay. but anyway, this is the true Alfonso, okay? It's not a derivative or some kind of seedling or whatever. Uh, this is what they grow over um, in, uh, you know, the western part of India where uh, it's commonly found. So, All right. anyway, we'll, we'll move on to some other mangoes that perform a little better here. Okay. Now, when you were picking the spots for your mango trees, did you particularly pick spots for these Indian varieties on purpose, or you just didn't think about it, you just put in wherever you had a spot. This area of the orchard was planted alphabetically, so the Alfonso just went there because it fell that position on the A row. And some of the other ones that we planted in this section of the farm were that way as well. The others, it was kind of just where space was available. So um, a couple of them aren't in ideal spaces, but several of them are, and it allows us to see how uh, one of these Indian varieties can perform in Florida if given, you know, optimal conditions. If somebody had different, if somebody in their yard had, was planting the yard and they had a good amount of trees room, would it be beneficial to grow like the Indian ones all together or not that you know of? It might be from a cross-pollination perspective if it's something that is commonly grown together. So in South India, for example, certain orchards might have certain mangoes kind of interplanted pollinating one another. But because India is such a huge country, a lot of varieties are never grown near one another. A lot of the northern Indian mangoes will never be grown near a southern Indian mango. Like an Imam Pasan is rarely, probably rarely being grown next to like a Dasheri or Chansa or, or, or Langra. So it probably doesn't matter so much. Okay. Uh, but they should cross-pollinate with a lot of the Florida varieties that have pretty complex genes. And they can certainly cross-pollinate with Southeast Asian mangoes too. So it's not, it, they're, they are the same species, Mangifera indica. And um, even though they're not all cross compatible, uh, there's enough cross compatibility that I think that people shouldn't concern themselves too much with planting an Indian mango next to another Indian mango. Are the ones you're showing us today, the variety is all 100% like Indian or are some of them cross pollinated? These are all 100% originally from the country of India. Great. They're all not right. hybrids from Florida that contain Indian genes or some other country that contain Indian genes. These are from India. Um, and people can chime in and comment on whether they're grown in their particular state. India has a lot of different states and a lot of different languages. So a lot of the mangoes we're talking about here, like the Alfonso, 
uh, sometimes goes under other names, like in Gujarat, they, they call it Hafus, I believe, uh, or at least some of them do there. There's some dispute over that, but, uh, and, um, you know, so, but some of these mangoes, uh, we'll, we'll talk about their other names too. Great. So. All right. Show us the next one. Okay. So we're going to go kind of out of alphabetical order here. Off the top of your head, number-wise, how many uh, Indian mangoes would you say you had here on the farm? It's in the dozens. I was trying to count it, and I just forgot the number. It might be 30-something or 40. Okay. I don't know. It's, it's several dozen. Uh, it's a pretty good collection of Indian varieties. Probably like one of the largest collections of Indian varieties you'll find outside of India. Because <laughs> nope. there's people in India with hundreds of varieties in their collection, you know, so. I know mangoes from certain countries have a distinct shape to most of them and you could tell. Like are Indian mangoes, do they look similar? No, to? Indian mangoes actually have a pretty broad spectrum of shapes and to some extent colors. Although most Indian mangoes will simply turn yellow, but like some of them get actually very nice reds and pinks and oranges. Um, and actually that's a trait that is more Indian than anything else because the Southeast Asian mangoes tend to just turn yellow unless they have some Indian influence to them, like Mahashanak, for example is a Thai mango that gets some color, but it's because it was a cross between a Thai and a Florida mango. And the Florida mangoes can trace their descendants in a lot of cases to um, India. Great. So um, Indian mangoes run a pretty large spectrum in terms of what their appearance is like. And this one here is an example. So this mango next to me is called Totapuri, also known as Bangalora, and it was originally introduced to Florida under the name Sander Shah. So that's three, or Sunder Shah. So that's three different names, at least, for this variety. It was introduced to Florida around 1900, I believe, maybe 1901, 1902. Um, and uh, it gets quite large. Now these are developing, so these are nowhere near full size. This mango can get several pounds in size. We've had them up to four pounds before. Um, very, very big. And it was, uh, like I said, one of the older varieties introduced here. And it actually can make fruit in clusters despite its large size. So this is a very important mango to Florida's mango history because um, after it was introduced, people planted seeds of the Sander Shah or the Totapuri as it's properly called. And we got new varieties of mangoes from this. So one of those was a mango that was later called the Brooks that was selected around 1916 in Miami. That was a seedling of this mango from the Brooks were bred other mangoes or came other mangoes such as the Kent, the Kit, the Hatcher, um, the Facel, and a number of other varieties. And so mangoes which are descended from that, of course, can trace their descendants to Totapuri. So I'll give you an example. The peach cobbler mango is a seedling of the Kent. Well, the uh, great grandparent of the peach cobbler or one of them, of course, because it has several, is Totapuri, or, or Bangalora, or uh, Sandra Shah, whatever you want to call it. Now, this mango in India is actually usually used for a few different purposes other than eating it ripe. It's an average mango when it's eaten ripe at best. It's usually used in canning, processing, and a lot of times Indian people will eat it just raw and green when it's not even mature yet, and they will put it uh, like as a snack with some salt and pepper and chili powder and things of that sort. And it's actually uh, enjoyable that way. And most of the fruit that we get on these, this tree, because we only have one, is sold as a green mango that's not totally mature and not going to ripen. In fact, if we let them ripen, a lot of times they'll develop splits in the fruit and they'll end up getting rot and decay. Uh, so they're really not very useful to us as a ripe mango, but we sell green totapuri quite a bit when the, um, the fruit are getting closer to maturity in the summer. So uh, you can pan in here, Paul, and see all the fruit that's in this tree. It's pretty remarkable. And it didn't even have a full bloom this year. This tree was pruned a little bit last year, and it actually only had a partial bloom, but it still ended up making lots and lots of mangoes. And uh, the, the poundage that we get off of it is gonna be pretty, pretty good. So it is a vigorous tree. Um, but it is one of the Indian varieties that tends to do well here in Florida, at least in terms of its productivity. So even though I mentioned it's not a very good ripe mango, in terms of its performance and yield, um, it 
handles Florida's climate and soil uh, pretty well. And this was kind of discovered back in the early 1900s when they were evaluating mangoes in the Miami area. Um, this variety, you can read in the old literature, was doing well 120 years ago here, and it still does well today uh, in terms of uh, how much fruit it can make and how consistently it can produce. So Great. All righty. So anyway, um, Totopuri, kind of an oblong-shaped mango, and it does get some red color when it's mature. Um, uh, so it's a different looking mango than the Alfonso we just And you at. have uh, the trees for sale and also the budwood at the appropriate For time. some of these, yeah. So some of these mangoes we don't get too many requests for because they're not very well known, especially by Westerners. So uh, most of the requests come from Indian customers or people that are familiar with Indian mangoes. But we absolutely do make Totopuri trees. Um, you might have to graft order it from us to get one right now. But we definitely produce it, and we sell budwood, you know, when there's active buds uh, on the tree. It's one of the ones that is on our checklist. So you can request us to check this tree for good budwood on our website. Um, so, and we sell some fruit. Obviously, we only have one tree, so we don't have, like, thousands of pounds of this mango. But it will appear in our online shop, and, and some of our boxes will offer uh, green totopuri for people that want to enjoy the, the mango green. Nice. All right. Is the season for Indian mangoes uh, all different, or is it particularly most of them? Are, most of them are mid. Mid. Okay. Um, most of them are mid-season mangoes. Um, there's a couple that are somewhat early, but I don't think any of them are super early. Like they're usually. I don't. I can't think of one that's usually in season around the same time of your standard early season ones, like Edward Glenn, Cogshall, stuff like that. Uh, most of them usually start um, at some point in June at the earliest. Uh, and then, you know, they peak in probably early July, so especially stuff like Alfonso and Kessar. Um, obviously, Totopuri is a late-season mango. Um, you know, Romani is kind of a mid-season variety, too. So, yeah, I, I would say if we were to survey them, most of them would come out as either mid or late mid What about in India? Is, uh, is it... The uh, mango season's different there. So mango season in India actually usually starts in March. And it will run till maybe May or June, um, but their mango season's usually over before monsoon season, before the wet season, and that's kind of by design too, because uh, the mangoes aren't going to be very good quality during monsoons. So their season does occur earlier uh, than ours. It ends earlier than ours here in Florida. Our season usually runs until August, sometimes September, and Indian mango season is long over by that point for most of the country. So. And I always wondered, like in Australia, the, uh, the seasons are complete opposite, right? It's opposite, right, yeah. Um, so their mango season actually occurs during our winter. Great. Yeah. Okay, wait, where are we going next? What tree? Okay, so next we're going to do, actually we can do this one right here next to us. This is, this is a mango called Jahangir. This is from uh, southern India. Uh, this variety is kind of known as a dwarfish behaving tree here in Florida. It does not color up very much. So we talked about some Indian mangoes getting red blush and whatnot. Jahangir actually develops very little color at all. It can turn a kind of a dull yellow, but a lot of the times this mango is actually still very much green when it's ripe, which makes it rather unattractive to some people. And when you cut it open, it's even less attractive to some because it's a very light color, almost a white color on the inside. But the flavor is very high quality. It's got a strong, what we call Indian West Indian flavor with a lot of spice and terpenes and a lot of resin present uh, and a bit of a, like an anise or, or light licorice note uh, to it too. Um, so it's a little bit similar to mangoes like Imam Passam. Ice cream mango, which is actually from Trinidad, has a similar flavor to this. Um, and uh, a little similar to white piri too, which is from Hawaii. So uh, all those mangoes can trace some Indian ancestry, though, even though they're from places other than India. But this one is grown over there in India. And um, here, it's a, like I said, kind of a small tree. Uh, does pretty well here in West Palm Beach. Now, I had one that did fruit in Loxahatchee, but I would not call it a very disease-resistant mango. Its disease resistance is probably average at best, although it does not have any problems with bacterial black spot. So that's a good thing. But probably further inland, it might struggle a little bit with anthracnose. Um, hasn't been too bad with powdery mildew, though. 
So a pretty dense canopy, okay, another one that's not, um, you know, very open in terms of the way it grows, but a productive tree, and it is grown commercially in southern India, so it has some commercial ad adaptation. Um, I'm not aware of it being grown in, in uh, any, any other, other country, but in, in, in parts of India, they've actually used this mango in their national breeding project a little bit, so there's some Jahangir hybrids that are um, named and grown in India on a smaller scale, but um, this one can still be found in some, I can't remember which states this one is common in, or maybe somebody can chime in and say, but like, uh, this is one of the varieties that does okay here. And uh, again, kind of a mid-season mango here. Uh, uh, sometimes flowers twice, so it flowers pretty easily here in Florida. This is not like these some of these northern Indian varieties that we'll talk about that don't bloom so so well here. So, wow. Yeah. So ice cream and white Perea, two of my favorite mangoes. So you would probably like it, this, Paul, if wow. you tried it. Wow. Yeah. And this the, is a dwarf. The tricky I mean, a thing. Tree. Yeah, it's a smaller wow. tree. I mean, some people might say dwarf. Obviously, this doesn't look like a dwarf tree now, but like it was a small tree when we planted this, and it's grown relatively slowly. We haven't really had to prune it, um, which is awesome. Um, the one that I grew in Loxahatchee was a pretty slow grower as well and had a pretty dense canopy. So. The tricky thing for a homeowner that plants one of these is that it's kind of hard to figure out when to harvest it, but unlike some of the other Indian mangoes, this one seems to tree ripen pretty well. And some Indian mangoes don't tree ripen well at all, but this one, you can leave it on the tree if you're not sure when to pick it, and if it drops off or whatever and ripens on the tree, it's fine to eat and it won't have any off flavors. So. Um, and that, that's great. It doesn't have any internal breakdown issues either. So I like that thing about Jahangir too. I don't have room for more trees, but you might have just convinced me to get another tree. Well, you'll get to try it this year because wow. uh, it's got a pretty good crop on it. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And if you've been watching the video, if you've tasted this mango, let us know what you think about it below. And, uh, it's certainly one of those varieties that you have to appreciate that spicy Indian mango flavor or you're not going to like it. But sure. Folks from India love it, of course, but uh, you know, there's a decent number of Americans that like it too. And um, it gets a little marred up, uh, so the fruit's not always so pretty, uh, but that part doesn't matter too much to people that appreciate its flavor. And the fact that it stays on the greener side is great for a, a crowded area like where I live. Where Correct, so wow. it's a mango wow. that, I mean, obviously some people will pick them green anyway, but if yeah. you're concerned about people like uh, being attracted to your fruit, this one's not going to attract anybody by its appearance. So we call them the two-legged animals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, well, we'll move right. on to a different one now. All righty. Jahangir. Okay. Jahangir, yeah. Jahangir. Okay. okay. Uh, so this one next to me here has a kind of uh, unusual name for Americans to pronounce. It's called Panchadara Kalasa or Kalasu. Um, this mango is grown in southern India, okay, and it's another southern Indian mango that does pretty well here. It is a, uh, another one also that doesn't develop much of any color, so these can sometimes turn a very dull yellow, but they'll usually stay pretty green even at maturity, which makes it tricky to figure out when to pick them, of course. But um, it will tree ripen okay, but it is better to be picked firm and then ripened on the counter because it doesn't go overripe as quickly. So it will go overripe rather rapidly if you let it tree ripen. So if you pick a tree ripened Panchadera Colossi, you got to eat it kind of quick. Um, it's a very soft mango. In India it is known as a juice mango. So they usually will drink the juice from this mango. Like they'll squeeze it like it's an orange or something like that. And it has an outstanding flavor. Um, this is one of the most delicious Indian mangoes to make it here to Florida, and its flavor holds up extremely well. So um, it has a, um, a little bit more of an open canopy, actually, than some of the other ones that we're discussing here. It's not uh, quite as dense, and you can kind of see that here. Um, and it will often flower more than once, so we get multiple blooms, and we have two of these, okay? So this is not our only Panchadera Colossa tree. We have two of them. One of them was a mislabeled tree. It was supposed to be a different kind of mango, and it turned out to be Panchadara Colossa, and we kept it because we like this mango a lot. And it does make it into our Indian flavored mango boxes because we 
get enough fruit from it uh, to uh, to put those in there. So, they look like they're pretty big fruit too. So they get nice size. This is not a, a, a really a, a small mango. It's a medium sized fruit and these still have some time to develop. Uh, actually, look, we've got a little bit of bloom coming out of it now. So it's a, a very willing bloomer here in Florida um, and in South Florida. So um, now are all these uh, what trees you mentioned so far all fiberless or some of them have this? OK, good point. So this mango does have some fiber, but not like an absurdly amount of fiber that people are going to object to. I would say you can slice this. And it won't like fill your teeth with fiber like an East Indian or a turpentine or something along those lines. Um, but it does have a little bit, and that's common with Indian juice mangoes for them to have a little bit of fiber. It has a very soft flesh, so this mango bruises very, very easily once it's ripe. So if they drop off the tree, expect a significant bruise, even if they're not falling from very high up. Uh, but despite that softness, the flavor is really there for it to, to shine. So. Uh, we like Panchadera Kalasa a lot, and people from the, the southern states of India where it's commonly grown, a lot of times will recognize that name. Um, so that's one of the reasons we grow it. Okay, so uh, this mango right next to me here is called Malika. Malika is a very well-known Indian mango now because uh, it is a mango that has adapted well to other countries besides India, which of course is not the case with some of the Indian mangoes we discussed, like Alfonso has not adapted well to other areas that's been introduced. Malika is a hybrid from India's National Breeding Mango Breeding Program. Uh, it was hybridized in the, in the 1970s, I believe. Um, a cross between the Neelam mango, which is a southern Indian mango, and the Dashiri, which is a northern Indian mango. So a hybrid between a northern Indian and a southern Indian mango. Um, and it's got a unique flavor, very different from the, the flavor that we associate with a lot of southern Indian mangoes. It is not a spicy mango. It is not resinous. It actually has a flavor that we would liken to citrus. In fact, we often compare this mango, a perfect example of it, compares well to mangoes like lemon zest, lemon meringue, uh, orange sherbet mangoes with that Burmese citrus flavor. And it got that flavor component from the dashiri. It did not get that from the Neelam. But unlike the Dashiri, this mango is much more likely to flower in South Florida's climate. So Malika got promoted here in Florida after the 90s um, by the Fairchild Tropical Fruit Program um, for being a, a mango that actually does well here. It actually is pretty anthracnose resistant and it's not so prone to powdery mildew that it can't uh, fruit without being sprayed. So it's been promoted as a dooryard mango. You'll even see Malika trees sometimes at places like Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, and it's done okay in Florida production-wise. The issue we've encountered with Malika here is that sometimes it gets internal breakdown. It's also a tricky mango to figure out when to harvest. So these are usually ready uh, at some point in later June or July. So it's very much a mid-season mango here. We've got more of them on this side of the tree. So Paul, if you want to come take a look over here. Now, I would not say this is a terrific crop for Malika. We've had better crops off of it before. It had a, I would call a partial bloom, but we're still going to end up with a decent number of them. So because we sometimes encounter ripening issues with this fruit um, in terms of internal breakdown of the flesh sometimes, we usually don't ship our Malikas. We usually actually will sell them locally. We'll uh, ripen a few, make sure they're actually tasting right and ripening properly before we sell them to the public. So it's a mango that we have to put some quality control into, just like the Alfonso for internal reasons. But people who like this mango really love it. It is also is probably one of the most removed or cut down mango trees in people's yards because a lot of people struggle to figure out when to harvest it. Um, in addition to the other issues that I mentioned. Uh, it does not turn red or pink, it only will turn yellow. However, it has the unfortunate trait of being one of those mangoes where if it tree ripens, it usually tastes pretty repulsive, um, at least for a lot of folks. So uh, a lot of the literature that you'll find about Malika suggests that it's a mango that should be picked uh, and ripened over the course of several weeks. We feel that that's actually um, not great advice, at least for people growing them here. 
We find that Malika tastes best if it ripens over the course of a week or slightly less. So we'll say anywhere from five to seven days for the fruit to ripen. A lot of times if you can catch them right when they're starting to get a little yellow somewhere on the fruit but still pretty solidly green at a stage where a lot of people wouldn't pick their mango, you pick the Malika and um, it will usually ripen pretty well and get that really nice enjoyable intense citrus flavor that people love about it um, you know when it ripens properly so but it can be a, a finicky tree uh, and it can be a finicky fruit so it's not one that I leap to recommend to people but we do keep one here on the farm and I did grow it in Loxahatchee and it did fruit in Loxahatchee so it can fruit in humid areas of Florida unlike some of the other more disease prone Indian mangoes like the Alfonso so um, Yep, so that's the Malika. And now, it's, yeah. What were you going to say in this? I was going to say sometimes it's been promoted as a small tree. It is not. It is a moderately vigorous mango tree. You can see ours is pretty large. So it's, a, it's similar size to some of the trees we planted in 2014 right in this vicinity. When you uh, graft these trees, are you putting them on a Pacific uh, uh, rootstock or does it make no, a difference? No, uh, well, most of them go on turpentine. So Malika grafts fine on turpentine, okay. uh, but we'll put them on other stocks too. But we haven't noticed anything that's going to make Malika like a dwarf. Uh, it's a moderately vigorous tree pretty much on all the stocks that we've put it on. Okay, I was so. wondering if they do better uh, grafting an Indian on a Indian rootstock or not necessarily. No, they do fine on turpentine, okay. most of them. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that's an issue. There's a few that are a little tr uh, tricky to graft. They don't graft as well as... Uh, some of the other ones because they're a little more fungal prone. So that can be a problem, but it's usually not a rootstock specific problem. It's just a problem with uh, humidity and, and fungus and such. So, okay. Okay. Okay, so we've gone over some of the more, uh, uh, we'll call them common varieties from India, or at least more well known varieties from India. But this one right next to me is one that's actually not even very well known in India. Uh, it is a more modern hybrid uh, that was done by India's National Breeding Program. Its name is Arka Nilkaran, and uh, I believe we've talked about this variety on uh, video before, but uh, since we're in the theme of mangoes from India, this is a hybrid uh, of the Alfonso and the Neelam. So Alfonso and Neelam are two very well known mangoes that are going to appear in this video. But uh, this tree is different from Alfonso in the sense that it is a much less vigorous grower. In fact, it is really very much a dwarf tree for us here. And from my understanding, it behaves as a dwarf in other countries as well. So this tree, you can see, has kind of an open spreading canopy. It is very short, very slow growing. Um, you can imagine this growing in a pot or something on somebody's patio. But it is very much Alfonso-like in terms of its shape, its flavor. Um, it develops more color though. It turns like a burnished orange color uh, a lot of times with sun exposure at maturity. It doesn't have the internal problems that Alfonso sometimes has either, at least as far as we've observed. So for us, this is a very, very interesting variety that we would like to see more people try, especially people that don't want to uh, attempt to grow a regular Alfonso tree or they're looking for a dwarfish tree that has that Indian Alfonso flavor. So um, it's done pretty well in terms of disease here. We don't know how it will do if it's taken to a more humid area though because we never grew this in Loxahatchee and I haven't gotten too many reports on the performance of this tree yet because so few people are growing it. But we do produce grafted Arcanil Karan trees for those that are interested in growing it. Someday we'll offer the budwood again when uh, we've gotten some more canopy development on this tree. It, it fruits every single year, which kind of slows the growth process down a bit, in addition to the fact that it's just not a naturally aggressive grower. So, um, but you can see it's got quite a bit of fruit on it. And we're looking forward to uh, enjoying these this year and sharing them with uh, some of our customers. And maybe we'll have enough of them at some point to put in one of our Indian boxes. I mean, uh, we've got several dozen fruit on here, so might sneak it in there some point. How old is this tree? This was planted, uh, what happened was we had a mislabeled tree here originally. Um, and so actually it replaced the mislabeled tree and it was probably planted around 2016, I guess. It was several years after we planted the trees here. It might've even been 2017, but this tree at this point is probably about seven or eight years old. 
This is pretty small for a seven or eight year old tree in Florida. Um, so it's grown slow. We got this actually from Frankie Sakia in Hawaii back when he used to ship trees. He does not ship trees anymore. But um, it was one that somebody introduced to Hawaii at some point. I don't know if it was Frankie or somebody else. So it came to us by way of, a, of Hawaii, even though it's an Indian mango. So, And uh, yeah, that's uh, Arcanil Karan. It's a mid-season mango here. A nice dwarfish tree for sure. Okay, so next to me here is a mango that has no fruit on it right now, but it actually did produce a fruit last year. Um, and, but even though it doesn't have mangoes on it right now, I'm optimistic that this tree will produce or perform well in the future. And I have historical reasons for that in addition to the fact that it has fruited for us already. But uh, this mango is called Borsha. This is a, an example of an Indian mango that is not commonly found in India anymore, at least under its original name. But it was one of the first varieties to be introduced successfully to the United States and Florida around the uh, turn of the 19th, 20th century. And um, it's a very, very good quality Indian, West Indian flavor, we'll call it, uh, comparable to something like the Bombay mango. So a nice, um, resinous, spicy, um, richly flavored and sweet mango. Uh, it's a medium-sized fruit, and uh, after they introduced it to Florida, I think they found that the trees maybe weren't so precocious, but after a while, they started to perform well here. For whatever reason, though, Borsha never got propagated in the nursery trade on a major scale, so it's a mango that's been kind of forgotten about, but fortunately still exists in some of the germplasm collections down in Miami-Dade County, which is where we obtained the budwood for this tree. I top-worked um, what used to be a lemon zest tree. I top-worked half of it or more into this Borsha. I left a little lemon zest because we need some to produce uh, some lemon zest trees for people still. But as this canopy develops on this, I think in the future we're looking forward to something that's probably going to perform okay here based on historical literature. But we got to give it a chance and see what it can do. So this is one we'll follow up on maybe next year in future seasons uh, once it's uh, flowering a little better and we can we can see what it can really do. But I tried this last year and was really impressed with this mango. So um, I just wanted to let people know it's something we're trialing out here. A very old variety, but potentially could still uh, do well today. So. And all these mangoes you're talking about, the descriptions on your website of all Yeah, we uh, try to update those descriptions at least once a year. So I think there is a description for Borsha now. And we are going to make it available for people that want to uh, get grafted trees or budwood from it. Uh, because it has fruited, so we verified it is what it is supposed to be. So um, this is just one that we wanted to mention that doesn't have a crop on it this year, but people should investigate a little bit and read about. So, All right. Yep. Okay, so this tree here is an Indian mango that has a lot of history in Florida, and it has a history in other countries too, so it's done well enough to get introduced elsewhere. But in India, this mango is known by a few different names. So I mentioned that some of these have multiple names. In India, this mango is primarily known as Pairi or Pahiri. It depends on how you're pronouncing this. Um, it is grown in western uh, central India, um, a little bit in the south, but um, very common in the area like between Mumbai and up to Gujarat or so, I suppose. But in India, it's also known as uh, raspberry, raspberry, R-A-S-P-U-R-I. It's also been called uh, Peters, among other names. But when it got introduced to Jamaica a very long time ago, they started to call it Bombay. Now in India, there is a Bombay, there's actually several types of Bombay mangoes, but they're not this mango. So in Jamaica, they called it Bombay. It was later introduced to the United States from Jamaica under the name Bombay, as well as from India under the name Pairi or Pahiri. It was also introduced to Hawaii under that name, Pairi. So, um, anyway, this mango... On your website, it's Bombay. It's actually, we have the other names listed too, but right. I think it's listed first under Bombay, because right. that's the most common name for this mango in the United States. It's been in the United States for over 120 years. It was introduced a very long time ago, so it was one of the early introductions made by the U.S. Department of Agriculture to Florida at the turn of the 19th, 20th century. Um, it did acceptably enough in Florida to stick around. Um, now, in modern times, this mango struggles to fruit here a bit, at least in the southeastern part of the state, because it doesn't get enough cold weather a lot of the time to get it to have a full bloom.
but this tree flowered pretty well this year. It wasn't a total complete bloom. Well, it was, it was pretty, pretty complete, um, at least for its standards. But we have another one, so we have two of these, and the other one barely flowered and doesn't have a lot of fruit on it this year. Um, but it has had good crops before. So it's an Indian mango that uh, otherwise handles uh, anthracnose and bacterial spot very well. It seems to be pretty much immune to uh, bacterial spot. It is, however, very prone to powdery mildew, and it is a hyper-vigorous tree. Bombay is one of the most vigorous trees, regardless of variety, that we grow that can be found in South Florida. It is just a very aggressive tree that has a spreading but very massive canopy. So this is not a tree that you can expect to keep small. Uh, at best, a tree that you could keep maybe between 12 and 15 feet of height with pruning, and it might fight you even then. It's a tree that needs space. Um, so it's not a great choice for a small yard. It's, it's a collector's mango, really, in Florida. Um, and uh, you need to have space for more than a few trees to think about growing Bombay. But it is an excellent mango. Right. This mango actually can get some pretty nice color to it. Uh, it can get some nice light red and pink with sun exposure with yellow background. So it's uh, a pretty mango. Uh, when it's in the canopy, it's usually just more of a yellow color. But uh, with sun exposure, this is actually a pretty fruit. It's not large, so they don't get very big. They're almost, most of the time, they're under a pound. In rare instances, when the trees don't load up very much after a bloom, um, they can sometimes you know, get like softball size or a little bigger. But um, it is an attractive fruit, just not very large. And it's very, very fiber free. So this mango is what we call a freestone, which means that we can literally cut it uh, around and twist it in half, and there won't be any fiber clinging to the seed. Most mangoes, even mangoes we describe as fiberless, will have some seed fiber that doesn't really matter for, for many people, but this mango doesn't really have seed fiber. The flesh kind of just comes right off the seed. So uh, it's a, a true, what we'd call a freestone, okay. which is a, a term often used with peaches and stuff, but man we have freestone mangoes, and Bombay is one of them. Bombay, to me, is the quintessential Indian, West Indian mango. It's like the prototype. Um, so if I wanted to describe that flavor to somebody, but not put it into words, I'd say, well, eat a Bombay mango and you'll know what we mean by Indian West Indian. Um, oh, yeah. It's a very rich, deep uh, flavored mango and extremely popular. Um, you, you gave me one last year and it was one of the best ones it's, I've ever it's, had. It's a great mango. I love Bombay. I wish the tree was a little better, but when they flower, they fruit well. So uh, as you can see, there's a lot of mangoes on this tree, and we're extremely excited to have a great crop on, on the Bombay or the Ross Prairie, as some of you will know it, or the Pyrie. Um, it is probably, or thought to be, one of the parents of the Jakarta mango, the other being Kent. So if Jakarta was a Bombay uh, Kent cross, and we're not 100% sure, but if it was, then a lot of the Zill mangoes can trace some descendants to the Bombay. Uh, the emerald mango is probably descended from the Bombay. We've done a video, Paul, about the emerald. So uh, Bombay is an Indian variety uh, with a long history in Florida, and I'm sure it's going to continue to be propagated in the Florida nursery trade, even if it's not on a great scale. We do make some Bombay trees every year, um, and we sell Bombay budwood. So um, yeah, definitely if you haven't had it before and you're curious, if you want to know if you're going to like Indian uh, flavored mangoes, this is a great one to try because it, it'll uh, open your eyes to what they really taste like in a lot of instances. Okay, so, so besides the known history of a mango just through like books and so on, like today you can spit in a vial and get a DNA test and find out your history. Yeah, your interest. that's right. Do they have any tests to, on, on fruit, specifically mangoes, to like... Um, to determine what the parenting is or? Yeah, actually they do. So they've done a uh, pedigree analysis on mangoes. Um, the only thing with mangoes is that it took a very long time to get to a point where they could do such analysis. But in the last 20 years or so, they've done some of them and they've gotten a little better at it. They've gotten more genetic markers as they're called um, with the mango genome that they can start to uh, compare ancestry or draw ancestry, if you will. So um, unfortunately, you can't just take your mango and send it somewhere to figure out what the variety is based on DNA alone. Um, that's something that's done only really by a few major research institutions. So the US Department of Agriculture in Miami has done it, but so have several other countries 
and their research arms in terms of uh, investigating uh, the mango genome and uh, understanding their, uh, their, their pedigree. So there's some published analysis out there if you're interested in reading about them and looking at them uh, that try to deduce what the parents were of specific varieties. So the USDA tried to do it back in 2003 or 4. They had a little bit of trouble. Um, you know, they got some things wrong, but they got some things right. And uh, some of the analysis that have come out since then have uh, built upon that a bit and gotten a little better. So it's fascinating stuff to me to see, like, because some of these, we had no idea what their parentage was or might have been because there wasn't anything in literature. There was no record of what they were a seedling of or what they were speculated to have uh, had as their paternal parentage. So it's interesting to look at those. And I, w I hope that in the future we'll be able to, uh, as private citizens, kind of try to investigate the, uh, the lineage of mangoes um, a little better. So Very nice, exciting. Yeah. Here's our Neelum. All right. <laughs> Neelum mango. So one of the most adaptable, successful Indian mangoes in existence, the Neelum. This is a mango well associated with southern India. Uh, it is grown on a major, major commercial scale in southern India. Uh, I believe they've tried it out a little bit in northern India too. Uh, but it's a mango that uh, has done pretty well in Florida um, compared to other introductions from India. So uh, Neelam is a smallish tree um, and it's a very disease resistant mango. So this is a mango that did really well for us in Loxahatchee. We had quite a few of them out there. They could fruit under those humid, wet conditions without any spraying at all, which was really remarkable to see for an Indian variety. Um, they will often overproduce. So this tree flowers very, very readily, and the result is usually mangoes in clusters and a lot of times weighted down to the ground. We really need to stake these off the ground. And if we thin them, we could get a little bit more size to them. I never really thin my mangoes, but like, otherwise they come out small. Neelum is a small mango. It is not even a medium sized fruit and certainly not a large one. Um, it is a fiber free mango with a rather small seed. It has a, what we call Indian West Indian type flavor. So it's got a little bit of that distinctive resin, but it's not super strong. It is what we would call a milder Indian flavored mango but an enjoyable one nonetheless. And the benefit of growing the Neelum mango in Florida is it is very, very late in Florida. It's not so late in India, but here it will last as late as October some years. We've had Neelum still hanging on the trees, but certainly in August, September mango, more years than not. So if you want something super late, Neelum is one of your only options and certainly one of the better proven performing options of any mango whether an Indian or a Florida mango or what have you. So it's, um, it's resistant to bacterial black spot, it's resistant to anthracnose, and it can fruit through powdery mildew. It'll get powdery mildew, but it will set fruit through the powdery mildew. So a very small, manageable tree. Uh, it's a mango that you should try first if you've never had it before to see if you'll actually enjoy it. But if you're looking for something very, very late, it's, it's one of really the best options for Florida just in terms of tree performance. So, Neelum, um, we can look on this side of the tree, Paul, it's, it's pretty loaded up here. Wow. Yeah. Now, <laughs> I've had, I, had a, I have a tree, uh -huh. and it fruits really late and everything, you said it tastes great. The only thing is, it's often uh, ripens unevenly. Is that Yes, so that these? can be an issue with Neelum. So, um, I did mention how a few of the Indian mangoes can uh, have issues with um, the evenness of their ripening. Neelum does sometimes have, not always, but sometimes does have a little bit of uneven ripening to it. Um, and it is also a little tricky to figure out when to harvest it on the tree. It will, you'll think that it's not ready and then the next day there's one on the ground because it often will stay fairly green. It will turn a little bit of yellow to it as it, as it ripens, but um, it's a little tricky. Uh, to harvest compared to some other varieties that will give you yellow color break um, a little more rapidly. So it can have that issue. 
All right, we'll do Kesar next. Okay, so right here we've got Kesar mango. Kesar is a variety that originated uh, most likely in Gujarat, India, the state of Gujarat, one of the central western states in India. And this is sort of the, the state or national mango of Gujarat. Um, this is a very beloved mango there. It is likely derived from the Alfonso. So based on flavor profile, a little bit on its shape, um, but it is not as vigorous of a tree. This is a more moderately vigorous mango tree. Um, still kind of a dense canopy, but nowhere near as dense and thick as the Alfonso, which we were just talking about earlier. Um, and in India, it's grown on a considerable commercial scale, especially in Gujarat, but also in some of the adjacent states. It has also been successfully introduced to other countries. So Kesar has been an Indian mango that's proved to be adaptable, and it actually does pretty well in Florida. Um, it's not perfect. It can have a few issues, but disease resistance wise, um, it handles anthracnose pretty well. It's only moderately prone to bacterial spot. It is pretty prone to uh, powdery mildew, however. But this is a mango from India that usually can produce pretty well, both in Florida, actually, and in California. So we're talking about a mango that has a pretty good range of where it can be successfully fruited, because a lot of the mangoes that fruit well uh, here don't necessarily perform well in California and vice versa. Um, but this one uh, does pretty well. Um, it is a small to medium-sized mango. And it uh, develops a minor amount of pink color to it, uh, depending on sun exposure. Uh, but usually we'll just kind of turn yellow here. And a lot of times uh, it does much better if we pick it green and ripen it off the tree instead of letting it ripen on the tree. It goes overripe rather quickly if we let it tree ripen. Um, and it can ripen a little unevenly if we let it tree ripen. But the ones which are picked mature and ripened off the tree can be really exceptional provided they're picked at the right stage. So, um, and that's how it's harvested in India. It's one of the mangoes actually exported from India to the West. So you can buy sometimes uh, exported Kesar mangoes. These aren't always very good quality because a lot of times they're actually picked a little too green before they're shipped to the United States. Um, but growing it here in Florida, of course, we can have the benefit of picking it uh, when it's meant to be picked, and it's got a very strong Indian Alfonso type flavor. I would say they can get actually a little sweeter than the Alfonsos that uh, we've picked from our own tree though. So uh, tends to be a more consistently tasting, uh, good tasting mango here. Uh, it can suffer a little bit when we get a lot of rainfall. Um, the flavor can sour out a bit, which can be a problem with Indian mangoes when, when there's too much rain. Um, but uh, we're generally very happy with the performance of our Kesar trees here. We have quite a few of them. I think we have seven or eight of them growing here, including a top work. So uh, I was able to get Kesar to fruit in Loxahatchee too. So it might be a good Indian mango for humid areas. Just make sure that if you grow this, control the powdery mildew, okay? Because it will get it when it flowers. And in fact, um, Paul, we can probably find well, okay, this tree flowered again, but we have examples of Kesars over here that we'll take a look at that flowered um, during the drought that we had for a while. So it's a mango that can flower off a of drought stress. We'll look at some of these real quick. Would you say of all the Indian mangoes you have, this is the one that you have the most of? Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, we've planted more Kesar than any of the other Indian varieties. Uh, we have, I did plant quite a few Neelums in Loxahatchee, but of course I, I no longer have that farm anymore. So um, yeah, the uh, Kesar definitely is uh, the most widely planted of the Indian varieties that we've trialed out here. You know, we have a couple of some of the others, like we have a couple Panchadar Kalasa. Um, we have a couple Bennett Alfonso, which we'll take a look at too. But you see this one flowered again. Okay, or actually it, it didn't even have a first bloom uh, when everyone else was flowering. Um, it flowered during the, the, the drought period that we had a couple months ago. And you can see actually the remnants of some powdery mildew on there. So these are gonna show it a lot more.
So this one actually flowered pretty well too. This is another Kesar. Um, and it still set fruit through the powdery mildew, which is encouraging. We did spray it a little bit with sulfur, but not nearly as much as we should have. So a lot of these little BB sized fruits are already starting to turn yellow, but we're gonna get, we got pretty good fruit set on these uh, Kesar trees on this, uh, this second wave that we were fortunate to, to get. So real happy. This one actually has uh, some, some fruit from the first bloom that's pretty well sized up at this point, but they will go a little bit probably won't be ready until uh, some point at the very end of this month or at least into June. But these guys here are going to be ready later in the summer. So we're talking about late July or actually probably August. So we'll, we'll have Kesars in August at least a little bit. Nice. So, but um, if you're thinking about trying out an Indian mango in Florida, Kesars definitely one to consider. Um, like I said, moderately vigorous tree, not a small mango, but not an overly aggressive one like the Alfonso or the Bombay. Okay, so this little dwarf tree here is Mahmud Vikarabad, um, and it is grown in um, uh, southern India um, and uh, in uh, Talangana state uh, is where it's real common, I believe. Uh, I might be mispronouncing that, but uh, anyway, um, it is a dwarf here in Florida. I believe it is a dwarf in India as well, so it behaves similarly in both countries. This one does flower pretty readily here and makes a really incredibly delicious fruit that is kind of hard for me to describe, but I would say it is a West in Indian, West Indian type flavor. Um, Paul, you tried it um, and uh, it's, it's superb. Nice. So we've produced a decent number of these trees by graft request and uh, it actually had a nice drought stress bloom. So this one has shown that it can possibly fruit under tropical conditions. Uh, being from Southern India, that's not totally surprising. But um, this is one that I kind of wish we would add more of, actually. Maybe we should think about top working another tree into this. Uh, it's outstanding. So this is one of my favorite tasting Indian mangoes. And so far, the uh, results on the internal quality and everything have been great, too. A um, little prone to powdery mildew, but it hasn't been bad with anything else. We haven't had any bacterial spot on it or anything like How that. How old is this tree? Oh, this tree would have been planted in 2018, and it would already have been a year or two old by that point. It was actually probably just a year or less old because it was one gallon when we planted it. So this tree at this point is uh, pushing six years of age, I suppose. So pretty Super small dwarf. tree. Yeah. yeah, I mean, definitely a dwarf. You can imagine fruiting this in a container or something like that, or in a very small space. So this might be something to consider. There's not a lot of these out there right now, um, you know, in production. Uh, but it's one that might you might think about if you've got a real small yard space, or you've got like a townhome, backyard, patio, something like that, and you want to try an Indian mango out other than Neelum. Um, you know, this is a nice dwarf option from what we can tell, or Ar like Arcanil Karan is the other dwarf one that we looked at before. Here's another dwarf that you might think about, so. Okay, so here we are in front of Ambika. Ambika is a mango from India that is a more modern hybrid, okay? I think it was hybridized since the 70s or 80s, I don't recall. But um, it is a cross between the Janardin Passand and another mango, I don't remember what the other parent was at the moment, uh, but I think I put it in the description. Um, but anyway, it is a beautiful fruit. It is a medium-sized mango that actually occurs very late here, and it fruits very willingly and well here in Florida. So it seems to appreciate our climate and soil, despite being originally from India. It has, unlike some of the other Indian mangoes we've discussed in this video, it has what we would call a classic mango flavor. So if you're a person that appreciates classically flavored mangoes, or doesn't like the flavor of some of the Indian flavored mangoes because it's a little too strong or off-putting for you, you might enjoy this variety quite a bit because it's got a very nice, rich, classic mango flavor. So if you enjoy like Kent or something like that, you'd probably like Ambika. A number of the Indian varieties actually have classic mango flavor. So Rumani is another Indian mango that we grow that has classic flavor, not spicy, resinous, what we would traditionally associate with a lot of Indian mangoes. So Ambika is uh, not too aggressive of a tree either. This was planted um, as a large three gallon in 2017. So it's not that aggressive, not that vigorous. Um, I don't know, we wouldn't call it a dwarf per se, but we might be able to label it as a small tree. 
I think, in terms of the rate of growth based on the ones that we've grafted so far. And we've produced this tree for uh, some customers. And um, it's quite late. We've had this mango have ripe fruit in September. So um, that's late by pretty much any Florida mango standard. It's, you know, hanging on the tree still when the Beverly's and, and things like that are still around. So, um, but not many people growing this. Um, you know, it's in some of the germplasm collections in Miami-Dade, uh, but I can't think of too many people off the top of my head. I don't know if any other farms are trialing this one out or not, but uh, for a nice late classic mango, uh, you might consider a, a growing Ambica. It is definitely one of the Indian varieties that seems to perform pretty well in Florida. So. Nice. Now, with all these varieties you have here, of all your trees, you don't label your trees, you just know where they all are? A lot of them are labeled, but some of them, the labels are incorrect because we've since top worked them or we discovered okay. that they were actually mislabeled, uh, like when we bought them from sure. a nursery. So um, we have a lot of labels here that are accurate, but a number that aren't that need to be removed or changed. The good thing is we do have an accurate map. So the maps that we have of the place are, are on point. And I do know what every tree is here. So like, um, I, if somebody really needs to know, they can ask me and then I'm able to tell them. But we would like to get the labeling down so that everything's got a proper label and uh, we don't have to worry about that anymore. And somebody can just walk up to the tree and look at the tag. Sure. So um, anyway, uh, okay, now another Indian variety here. This one is another one that's not too well known in India, um, at least, uh, by its historical name. Um, this mango is known as Bennett Alfonso. This was one of the early introductions around 1902. The um, Bennett Alfonso was sent from India. It was an Alfonso derivative that was, I think, mostly found in the Mumbai area. And it was grown by a, a well, it was sent here, I should say, by a man named Douglas Bennett. Douglas Bennett was an English horticulturalist um, that operated out of India at the time that India was still a British colony. And so um, I think it was referenced as Douglas Bennett's Golden Alphonse is what they called this thing. So this was an Alphonse derivative that was probably selected around the 17th or 18th century from what the historical record says. Um, so probably like a seedling of Alfonso that looks and behaves like Alfonso in many ways. But here in Florida, this Alfonso derivative is much more eager about fruiting. So you can see the physical resemblance and taste-wise, it tastes like Alfonso. But it flowers so much easier than the normal Alfonso does here. And it seems to be much more disease tolerant or resistant uh, than the standard Alfonso as well. So. I think the Bennett is one that should have become more popular, but for whatever reason, it was never um, commonly propagated in the Florida nursery trade in the early part of the 20th century. So it kind of got forgotten about, but it remained in those old collections in Miami-Dade. And one day I was down there, uh, and I knew about this mango, but I was down in Dade County a number of years ago, and I saw some of these fruiting down there at um, the University of Florida's property at Trek. And I couldn't believe how much fruit I'd never seen an Alfonso, like a regular Alfonso with crops like these things had. So I was so impressed that I had to get some budwood and I top worked this tree into the Bennett and it fruited very, very quickly. It fruited like in a year or two after grafting this top work. And I was so impressed by that, I, I later top worked another tree into the Bennett Alfonso. And um, the historical literature supports it doing well here. So uh, I feel like this is one that people with um, a little bit of yard space can trial out themselves too, probably with the expectation that it should fruit for them. And uh, we'll see how it does in the long run. We've only been fruiting it for a few years, but we've been impressed with this mango. And uh, I think um, you know we'll get some more feedback when some of the people that we've sold trees to uh, test it out a little bit as well. Uh, so Bennett Alfonso, uh, a much, much more productive version of the Alfonso mango. And, and how does it taste compared to the Alfonso? I think that the fruit we've gotten off of this tree so far has been as good as the fruit that we've gotten off of our Alfonso when the fruit on our Alfonso has tasted good. 
So it's, it's, it compares well. The fruit might get a little larger, I think, um, than the regular Alfonso does. Um, but the foliage looks similar too. It looks so similar, but you know it's a distinctive variety. Uh, they felt, I think, that it got a little better color than the standard Alfonso did in Florida as well. Now there's also a white Alfonso, which we do grow but have not fruited yet. Um, so that's another interesting Indian variety that is an Alfonso derivative of some sort that has some history here in Florida. But this one we have quite a bit of confidence in from what we've seen out of it so far. And uh, you can see here, actually this one's developing a little bit of golden color at the top already, but it's uh, nowhere near ready yet. So anyway, um, this is actually only half of a tree technically. This top work is shared by another variety, but we have a, vari uh, a tree that we've top worked completely into Bennett so that we can kind of give Bennett its own opportunity to uh, see what it can do. All right, well, thank you for showing us uh, all these different trees and there's so many more you have. So I remember you said you had like 30 something varieties from India. It's a pretty yeah. long list. So, so we'll uh, have a part two, we'll do a part two in the future and we'll put in a list below here all the mangoes we discussed. People can get the description from your website. Give everybody your website. Yep, tropicalacresfarms.com. We have a list of every mango we grow on the website. Um, in the mangoes section of the website. So if you want to click and read about the varieties that we've grown and our experience growing them and what we have to say about them and see photographs of what they look like, um, it's a good uh, educational opportunity. And also you can pretty much order almost any variety on the list to be grafted for you. If we don't already have it in stock, you should always call us or email us if you want to see if something is already in stock but you can always graft request something on our website if you want to get one of these rare, uh, hard to find trees. Um, we love making trees for people and um, I hope that you'll uh, check out our website. So now, a lot of these varieties are in your Indian box. Yeah, uh, at least when we've got enough mature fruit to do it. So some of them obviously, we only have one example of the tree or, or two, so maybe we don't have them in abundant supply, but um, if we've got enough ripe ones to throw like uh, one or two in each of those Indian flavored boxes, we'll do it. So during uh, the peak mango season in a month or so when we're selling those Indian flavored boxes, you can check them out and see what varieties we're happening to put in, in those boxes that particular week. So, and we'll, we've even last year and the year before that, we did some Kesar only boxes. Um, for people that really wanted Kesar. So, um, but I definitely put a lot of other Indian kinds in those boxes in addition to the varieties from Florida and other places that have Indian flavor. So Indian flavor would be like an endless video, right? Because we have so many varieties that have Indian flavor that aren't necessarily from India. But some of those native Indian mangoes do make it into the Indian flavored box sometimes. Great. Thank you very much. Everybody check out the website. The link's below. And remember, this is part one. We will do another part and talk about more of the different trees. And if you want to know if he has a tree, check out his website. It shows all the trees he has. And if there's one you're watching that you know of that you, he doesn't have, certainly contact uh, Alex or put it in the comments below and he could experiment or check that out. So thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you, Alex. That was one of my favorite videos I've ever done because I learned so much and so many Indian varieties. And remember, that was part one. We're going to be doing a part two, maybe even more, part three and so on, depending because he has so many varieties, Indian varieties. And if you want to order or taste any of these varieties or get the tree, the link's below the video in the description. Thank you, Alex, so much for taking the time out to show us these amazing, amazing mango trees. Until then, everybody, put your comments and questions below. Subscribe if you like this video and share it with others. And have a great day and keep growing.